We're going to be very, very focused on doing all the things that we can, as well as we can, turn Manchester United into a winning side again. Coming up in this edition of InTV. It's a big moment for the group as Sir Jim Ratcliffe becomes co-owner of Manchester United. We'll hear from him about the future for the club. We're back in China to find out what's happening at our Acetals plant in Chongqing. And we'll get the latest news from around the INEOS group, including a new announcement from INEOS Automotive. This is InTV. Manchester United, a legendary name in the world of sport and probably the world's most popular football club. While recent years have had their challenges, a new era has dawned for the club with Sir Jim's investment. Yes, the Sir Jim Ratcliffe era at Manchester United has officially begun. And just a few weeks ago, he walked into this famous stadium for the first time as a proud co-owner of the football club he's supported since he was a boy. So without further ado, let's find out just what Jim's plans are for this great club. So Jim, we are delighted to say officially welcome to the Manchester United family. Congratulations. Tell me how it feels. It feels wonderful, obviously. It's, it, it, um, you, you sort of have to pinch yourself a little bit. It's, not, it's something I could never have contemplated when I was, I was younger, obviously. So it is a bit of a boyhood dream, I suppose, that they're not supposed to come true, but in this case, obviously, it did. Can you describe your vision for the club on and off the pitch? I think the, the only interest we have is in winning football matches and competing for the Premier League and competing for the Champions League. That's our only interest in being involved in Manchester United. That is what Manchester United is about. It's, you know, in, I mean, maybe I'm slightly biased, but I think it's the, you know, it's the biggest and the greatest and the most well-known football club in the world. So it should always be competing for, you know, the league title and the Champions League title, always. In terms of what are our expectations off the pitch, if you like it, I mean, that's just about values, I think. And, you know, we, you know, Manchester United does stand for certain values. It's got a style of football, it's got, you know, a, a code of values by which, it, you know, people have to respect. You've spent time with Sir Alex Ferguson, of course. Yeah. I actually was listening to an old interview that you had done a couple of years ago when you were asked for your three dream dinner guests <laughs> and you did actually say Sir Alex Ferguson but you okay. had actually mentioned him or met him sorry once before but he was on your dream dinner list yes I'm and look where we are now yeah I've met Sir Alex he's a, the world's iconic coach and he's he's just a, an essential part of that Manchester United history I mean he has made history for Manchester United in those 27 years he was there really and uh, you know, he was the greatest manager of his generation. Uh, let's talk about players then. I know that Eric Cantona is one of your favourites. Yeah, yeah, very much so, yeah. Were there any others? Were there any players you maybe perhaps emulated as a child growing up in the streets? Well, I suppose in my younger days, you know, it was Bobby Charlton and George Best, really. They were the, the two icons, I suppose, that, you know, that everybody loved. and. Um, you know, there's a certain type of player when he gets the ball, you get excited when he gets the ball because you're not sure what he's going to do with it and it might be, it might be, you know, a bit of magic. Eric was, you know, clearly, he clearly, clearly one of those. And, it, and he was so transformative for, for that Manchester United team and Alex Ferguson. You know, they, they obviously hadn't won the, they hadn't won the league for 25 or 26 years, I think, before Eric arrived and then Eric arrived. And, and, and he was that catalyst, really, that galvanised the team for the next, for the next 25 years. Uh, we are on the cusp of having a 250th homegrown player making it into the first team, which is an incredible achievement for our academy programme. And it's a key component of the club's DNA, yep. I suppose. I agree with that, it is, yeah. Would you agree this commitment to youth development is what United is all about? Well, it's not what it's all about, but it's certainly a huge component of the success of Manchester United is the youth development, and we, we would absolutely support. You know, it's attacking football, it's exciting football. They like to bring the young players through. They like players that play to the last minutes of the game. I mean, we, we have three words that we use in INEOS, uh, which I think encapsulate INEOS really well, which is grit, rigor, and humor. 
Um, and I think that a lot of that applies to football, you know. Grit, you definitely need grit. Rigor is, you know, putting yourself into training, doing things well and properly. And, you know, life's always, there's always a bit of adversity in life, so you need a sense of humor, and also you spend a lot of time there, so you need to enjoy it, you know. And then, you know, the other strap line in Ineos, um, which sort of underpins grit, rigor, and humor, is, is manners, and I think that's really important as well. Our professional women's team, it's only in its sixth season. How important is it, though, for United uh, to be at the forefront of the development of the women's game as well? Any team that wears that Manchester United badge on their shirt you know, needs to be, uh, needs to be, so it's, it's important to the club because they're wearing the badge and they need to be successful and winning. So they're all important components. Of that. You want to see more of these Champions League programmes on this table the next time we meet. <laughs> that would be ideal. Yeah, How important are the fans for the success of the team? You know, you've been a fan, you've seen yeah. they can often be the 12th man on that pitch well, on that, occasions that, like that. That's what the club's all about, is the fans, really. They, I've always said that these shareholders, you know, myself and the Glazer family, we don't own the club. The, the true owners of the club, the fans, the community, and, and we're merely guardians or stewards for a period of time. The club is a community asset, and so it's all about the fans, really. This is your first opportunity to publicly address the fans. What would your message be to them? So the message to the fans, I think, absolutely our priority with Manchester United is performance on pitch, so we want Manchester United to be challenging for the Premier League, challenging for the Champions League. That's what Manchester United is about. It's, you know, it's the greatest club in the world, so it should be playing the greatest football in the world. But it's not a light switch. That takes time and it takes a bit of patience. The important thing is, I think, that we all observe the trajectory of Manchester United over the next two or three seasons and the trajectory has to be in a good direction. So I think that's how I think we should be measured. People, I, I would ask for a bit of patience, but ultimately, you know, the performance of the club does sit on our shoulders. Um, and, you know, we need to take the, you know, the, the rough with the smooth. So if we're successful, that's fine, I think. It would be nice to uh, to get a pat on the back for that. But if we're not successful, then it's, you know, it's on our shoulders. So we, we fully accept that responsibility. You know, we're going to be very, very focused on doing all the things that we can, as well as we can, to, you know, turn Manchester United into a winning side again. That's, that's why we're here. Thank you, Jim. This place is incredible, full of so much history and so much more to come. So make sure you follow us on social media to find out more from the Theatre of Dreams. Yeah, it's really going to be something special. And it's no surprise that China has more fans than any other country. Over 250 million at the last count. So let's head over now to Chongqing, right in the heart of the country. This dynamic metropolis is home to a staggering 32 million people and a substantial manufacturing industry. This location is therefore significant for our Acetars business, Yarico, which is a joint venture between INEOS and Sinopec. So we're actually in southwest of China. This is an area that Chinese government has been driving to develop. There's huge population, so there's a high demand and growth opportunity. Yarako is the shortfall of the Yangji River Exdale Company. The first phase production start in 1998. The first phase is 150,000 ton acetic acid, and then it expands further, you know, to downstream uh, ester, and then we further expand acetic acid to 350,000. SDS usually fit into the industrial sectors such as the PTA, VAM, ESTAS, and then moving to uh, the end applications. Coating, fiber, ink, as well as some pharmaceutical and agriculture sectors. You can see SDS is actually very closely linked to our daily life. Your customer relationship is a foundation for our good business. Our customer is definitely looking for the quality product, the security of supply, as well as good world-class customer services. 
uh, because we are the sole suppliers in this region, so we will uh, keep working with the customers to see the growth opportunities together. We are using Katiba technology. This is the leading technology of acetic acid. Our product quality has been well recognized by our customers. In Continuous Improvement CI就持续改进是我们一直坚持使用的一个工具。那么我们也不断地寻找可提升的这个机会，比如说无论是从能能量的这个效率的提升，啊，减少我们能源的消耗，减少碳的排放，啊，为我们客户提供更加绿色的
This represents 10% of our electricity consumption. And by replacing electricity coming from the cogeneration plant or coming from the grid, it will help us uh, reduce our carbon emissions by about 14,000 tons per year. Under a power purchase agreement, INEOS Innovin will acquire all the green electricity produced from the Jemeps de Sombre project for the next 15 years. This project is developed in partnership with Perpetuum Energy, which will build, finance, operate and maintain this field for 15 years on behalf of Innovin. As you can see, the construction is progressing well. We started in September last year and we intend to finish this project by July this year. In an open letter, Sir Jim Ratcliffe has voiced concerns to European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen that Europe risks losing its industrial base, as well as jobs, investments and inadvertently increasing emissions. This message was emphasised following the European Industry Summit in Antwerp, where industry leaders presented EU policymakers with the Antwerp Declaration for a European Industrial Deal, advocating a competitive and sustainable industrial strategy. In his letter, Sir Jim highlights the European chemical sector's inability to compete globally due to the high energy costs and carbon taxes, contrasting this with the US approach of incentivizing clean technology. He warns that without addressing these challenges, Europe's once leading chemical sector faces a bleak future. Therefore, a re-evaluation of Europe's industrial strategy is needed to foster investment and innovation in cleaner technologies. Anyone who follows the business closely will know that there is a particular pub in Belgravia in London that's become part of INEOS folklore. But a couple of weeks ago, the Grenadier pub went through something of a facelift to celebrate the launch of the new electric offering from INEOS Automotive, the Fusilier. What's interesting, you're a new, a fledgling car company. Mm -hmm. You're already got design cues that you're harking back to. So you're only three models in, you've got Grenadier, Quartermaster, and now the Fusilier. Yeah. But there are design cues that you're able to refer to already. When we did the Grenadier, we had a very sort of clear brief um, of what we wanted it to be able to do and uh, the sort of function of it. Um, and so we've really just taken that again. Then we've got a different set of parameters now. But now we've got a few more kind of edges to, to kind of work within because we've got the Grenadier to the, the lineage of that to sort of respect. But the idea for Grenadier came about in here, and now there's a lineage. You've got a new car out, yeah. and people are going to go, oh, I can, I can tell that that's one of yeah, the part of the family, yeah. I think it's really important for, for us that, that we have some sort of common threads in, in our automotive offering, both in terms of its sort of essential DNA, what it, what it does for you, but also, you know, design is so important. And, you know, we always said we had that triangle with the uh, with the Grenadier. We had, you know, off-road capability, reliability, and then looks. And you know, we always said looks follows off-road capability and reliability. But in reality, looks are so important to you know people won't buy something that they don't like, even if it's very very good at its job. They won't buy it if they if they don't like it. So that we, we're trying to sort of follow through along with the. DNA of its capability, if you see what I mean. Just coming down to the broader car industry, because this is an interesting time to launch an entirely new car mark, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yes. it's a changing world. So yes. what are we going to see in terms of powertrain in the Fusilier? And then we'll slot it into the broader industry. So what is powering that? It's obviously an industry in flux at the moment. You know, 10 years ago, it was a very steady state, but it's very, very much in flux at, at the moment because people are not absolutely sure. They, they know what the objectives are, which is obviously to reduce the carbon footprint of the world's sort of automotive fleet, but they're not absolutely sure how to do that. Um, but it clearly, if you're in Europe, if you're a car producer in Europe, you have to have a green offering. I mean, you can't survive as a large car company without that because the, you know, the regulations won't allow you to. You know, our immediate instinct was to do what really all the other car companies are doing, other big ones are doing in Europe, which is to go down the electric vehicle route. Um, and and we, we sort of, we'd gone quite a way down that road um, until, you know, a few months ago where, where we stopped and paused a little bit because America's taking a different view to Europe. Europe is saying that you'll all drive electric vehicles uh, and we'll, we'll can the combustion engine. Whereas America is, is saying, 
We need to see that the trajectory is going in the right direction, but there probably isn't one solution for all purposes, and we can't force the consumer to buy something that doesn't do what he wants it to do in some circumstances. So the, the big problem I have with the electric vehicle is what we all sat down and talked about. It has two huge failings. One, it doesn't get you from A to B if you want to go on a, a decent journey. It does the urban stuff very well, and you can't fill it up. You know, a lot of the population, um, you know, they do want to go on a long journey. They don't want range anxiety, and they don't want this anxiety, am I going to be able to fill the car up or not? You know, is there going to be a plug available? Is there going to be a queue? Is there one available? My personal strong preference is the same electric vehicle, and it's always an electric vehicle, but with a range extender under the bonnet. So you have a small engine under the bonnet with a generator, and you have a s smaller fuel tank, and the battery is probably 70% the size. So you finish it with, you know, this is an electric vehicle will have a range of 700, uh, sorry, 400 kilometers. But if you have a range extender, it'll probably have a range of two, 270 or something like that. But you don't have range anxiety because you will always be able to get from A to B. And the range in the extender modern world. doesn't drive the wheels ever. That is purely no, never to charge the battery and extend. That's all it does. And it doesn't, it doesn't vary in tempo. It doesn't accelerate. It's not connected to the So earth. it can it run at optimum. It. Steady state. It's super, super efficient. It's very small. It just runs a generator, that's all. You don't need a big engine, you don't need variable valves and all that sort of thing. It's a really simple piece of equipment. And that's it for another episode of InTV. It's an exciting moment as we enter a new era with Manchester United. But the challenge is real as we try and get the club back to the top of English, European and world football. We hope you'll join us on the journey. And until next time, come on you Reds! Yeah.